Hi, everybody, and welcome to Deborah Cobalt Live today. We have a terrific guest in studio with us, Erin Carr, who wrote the book Strung Out, One Last Hit and Other Lies That Nearly Killed Me. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Flying in just from New York to be on our show. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're so welcome. <laughs> um, so you're also a columnist, right? Yes. You write a column called Ask Erin. Um, which is published on Ravishly? Ravishly, yes. Okay. You've written for Marie Claire, Esquire, Cosmopolitan, Good Housekeeping, Red Book, and then some. Uh, but you're here mostly to talk about your book, Strung Out. Yes. Um, which is fascinating. It sort of gave me chills to read this, I got to tell you. Um, what is Strung Out and why'd you write it? It's a memoir about my 15 year struggle with heroin addiction, which began at age 13 and ended at 28 with motherhood. I, you know, I as I started writing about my personal life, not only in the advice column, but in essays and articles, I had such a huge response from people um, about opening up about the topic of addiction. And, you know, when I was going through this, there weren't a lot of girls like me. When I went to rehab the first time, I was the youngest person there by a decade. I was the only heroin addict and one of three women. Those demographics have really changed. And I wanted to write a book for the person I was then, the book that I had needed when I was a young woman struggling. How old were you when you did your first set of drugs and what were they? So, the, well, the very first time I ever took an opiate, I was only eight. Oof. I was having a panic attack and I didn't know that it was a panic attack. I was really struggling with some depression that I didn't have the language for. I went into the bathroom and there was an expired bottle of Darvacet in the medicine cabinet. It was my grandmother's and it was, I mean, it had been sitting there a long time. Nobody in my family was touching it. I looked wow. at the label and it said, may cause drowsiness with a little drawing of the guy with the bubbles around his head. And I didn't know that it was a painkiller. I just knew that it caused drowsiness and I wanted to be drowsy. At the age of eight. At the age of eight. So I took a pill and I really liked what it did for me. It sort of gave me an exit from the feelings that I had, an exit from reality, and a way to sort of control that overwhelming panic that I felt. Did you not feel that you could have, you know, called your mom or dad, or were you ashamed that you were feeling this way and anxious? Like, tell me a little about I it. I was definitely ashamed that I felt that way. Yeah. I also had some childhood trauma. I had been sexually abused at four, and I didn't tell anyone. And carrying that combined with the depression and anxiety, I was so afraid of anybody knowing. It was that sort of primal fear that many of us struggle with, this sort of idea that, like, if anyone knew this, they wouldn't love me. What is it that we're all carrying around, I sometimes wonder, in life um, that we struggle with and hide? You know? It's, oh, it's, yeah. It's sad when I read your book that you felt like you had to struggle. But at the age of eight, you didn't know why you were feeling this no. way. But if you don't mind, can we dive a little bit into the abuse? Sure. Sexual abuse. Sure. Um, what, through your research mm -hmm. and through all the therapy you've had, what is it that sexual abuse does to a young person's mind? Well, I mean, first of all, it happened when I was so young. Yeah. It's a really formative age. And I think that the thing about trauma, and I write about this in the book, is that it doesn't record in our brains the same way that a regular occurrence, like sitting here having this conversation, when we think back on it, we'll have a fairly clear memory of it. With trauma, your body records it much differently as a way to protect you as well, because it's a lot to process. Uh, there's a book called... Um, the, the Body Keeps the Score that's been on the bestseller list for a long time now. Hmm. And he talks a lot about the way trauma lives in the body. And I think that that's very true. So the way I look at trauma is it sort of your brain takes it and takes it and puts it into lots of little pieces like an undone jigsaw puzzle. And I think a lot of people that I've spoken to who also had like early childhood abuse of some form have experienced a similar thing. You know, and then there's the shame inherent in sexual abuse. There's an inherent shame in it, especially for young women. I think that, you know, we're constantly given this messaging that our value is is centered around our sexuality, yet we're also sort of shamed for it from a really young age. And so you combine that with, with sexual abuse, and I think that it really sort of sets you up for for carrying maybe more shame than the average person. Yeah, and everybody, I suppose, deals with it differently, right? Mm -hmm. Like for you, when you were feeling your anxiety, mm -hmm. you just wanted to suppress it and go to sleep and yes. rest, right? Yeah. 
Did you ever try to do anything way worse than put yourself to sleep? Did you ever want to just Oh, for sure. For sure. I mean, I say in the book, and I've said this when I speak about addiction, that heroin saved my life. If I had not found heroin at 13, I would have... I I would have tried to keep killing myself until I succeeded. I fully believe that. And that's not to say that I'm advocating for people to do drugs. It's just that at that time, I didn't have any other way out of the feelings. I just wanted out of my skin. I could not sit in my body. So let's talk about that. You, from your grandmother's medicine cabinet, Mm -hmm. what came next and how old were you and why? Sure. So from eight on... I would start looking for pills occasionally, not not all the time, but when mm-hmm. I would be at, you know, like a friend's house, I would go in their parents' medicine cabinet or family members' medicine cabinets, and anything that had a warning label on it, I would kind of <laughs> take and stock away mm. if I needed it. Right. When I was 13, I was on a date with a 16-year-old guy that I had met on a skiing trip earlier that year. I had been horseback riding that day, and I told my mom I was going to my friend's house, and I lied to her. Where'd you go? I I went to his house. (laughs) He picked me up. I had lied to him, too. I told him I was 15, and this was 10 days after my 13th birthday. Mm -hmm. As I was there with him at his house, his parents weren't home. He lived in Beverly Hills and Truesdale Estates. You know, we're in this big house. We're alone. I'm excited and nervous, but then also the anxiety was coming up, and I asked him if he had any Vicodin. Or Valium, and he what said he did. He, did. He, he was surprised, and he said he didn't. And then wow. he asked me if I'd ever tried heroin. Ugh. And I hadn't. I said no. And then I asked him if he had any, and he said yeah. Didn't that scare you, even just to think that you were going down that road? No, wow. I mean, you know, I the only way the way that I always describe this is I believe that addiction comes in long before the drugs are present. The decision was already sort of made. I was already a person that was desperately searching for an exit all the time. And I just needed some way to get out of my own body, out of my skin. You know, I was 13. I wasn't thinking about like the ramifications of of, of the drug. I knew that I didn't know that much about heroin. I knew from like books and movies that like it got you like really out of it and high and I wanted that kind of disconnect from reality. So I tried it and that night and that was when heroin entered the picture for me. And I, you know, I struggled with heroin addiction for 10 years before my family found out and before 95% of the people in my life knew. Hmm. Did anybody, did you give off anything when you went home, when you were home? Did mom or dad look at you like that, you know? I remember being in high school and, you know, the worst I ever did was pot. I wasn't, it, I just don't have, a, you know, my body doesn't crave that. Right. Other stuff, but not drugs. Um, and I remember smoking a little pot and I'd come home with the munchies. Right. At least that's what they called it then. And I would have everything out on the table, everything from the peanut butter to the pot. And they would look at me like, what's going on Mm -hmm. like did you ever give that something's going on well I mean you know early on most of the times that I would use I would use you know I didn't use every day I'd use on the weekends with him and I always Mm. lied to my mom about where I was staying and she never checked and so I wouldn't come home high necessarily but then you know of course at some point I did start using at home and I'd use you know it was the same sort of thing it was very controlled I'd use at night um, before I, you know, I wasn't strung out. It takes a while to get strung out initially. So I, I would use at night by myself. And, you know, I had straight A's. I had a lot of friends. I was a cheerleader. I was a horse. I was horseback riding. I was a volleyball player. And the only times that my parents were concerned about my behavior were the periods of time that I was not on drugs. So I stopped. Oh, wow. That's a surprise. Shortly before my 15th birthday, I stopped using altogether. And, and had a couple of years where I didn't use any drugs. And I became so volatile emotionally. I was just a wreck because I didn't have the drugs to sort of contain all that, that emotion. That's when my parents sort of noticed really that something was going on. They sent me to therapy and were really worried about me. And, and hmm. they didn't have it all of the t- – throughout my whole 15-year drug history – the times when I seemed the most in trouble were the times when I was not on drugs. You know, up until the end, though, it got bad. You know, it got bad at the end. Should you have been like under a controlled whatever the doctors, you know, psychiatrists mm-hmm. would give you or pharmacologists? Mm-hmm. Should you have been on something to calm you down, or 
Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, certainly. I mean, I, t- I take a mood stabilizer now that's very popular, Wellbutrin. It's not, you know, it worked for me. I wish I had gone on it many, many years before I did because I think that it, I certainly needed, I had a lot of trouble regulating my emotions. So I turn to narcotics as a way to regulate my emotions. And I think that that's true for a lot of people, particularly people who start abusing drugs at a really early age. You know, it wasn't, this is not like, nobody as a child is like, you know what I want to do when I grow up? <laughs> I want to be a heroin addict. That's not that's a thing, you know. I always say that of people that we see in the streets, they mm-hmm. weren't two, year old, two no. years old saying, can't wait to live there. No, of and course not. And the same not. with being a drug user. Of I course. Mean, this is not how you envisioned it when you were three or four. No, right? of course not. Um, so take me back to the heroin use. I mean, how did you ingest it? I mean, what did you do? Were you hiding in your bathroom? Like, mm-hmm. how did you do it? So, I mean, initially, again, it was mostly done with my boyfriend and we were using needles and, you know, thank God for programs like needle, you know, at that time it was called clean needles now and there's different needle exchange programs. So I didn't have to use a dirty needle. And as a result, I never contracted HIV or hepatitis C. But didn't you have, you know, you could see when people are using needles. I guess you just always kept your sleeves down, right? Yeah, I mean, I think, and then, again, like those first couple of years, it was mostly on the weekends. It was mostly intravenously. And then we also sometimes would snort it because his his brother, it, he started because of his brother. So his brother would sometimes get powdered heroin, which was not very popular or not as accessible in California. Later on, um, when I sort of, got really bad with heroin again in the 90s, I was smoking it and then went back to needles for a period of time, but I had a bad overdose and I made it my friend who saved my life. We we made a commitment to each other because I got her strung out and we made a commitment to each other not to use needles anymore and I never did again because it wasn't so much that I cared about dying. I didn't want anyone to find me like that. Wow, what about your parents at this point? So my parents didn't find out until I was 23. I was caught by my then fiance um, and he had no idea. I mean, he started getting suspicious that something was wrong, but he didn't know what it was. He caught me literally in the act and, you know. What were you doing? I was shooting up. Could you imagine? Wow. So So he walks in, he sees you shooting up and you're like. It's, it was, yeah, he was shocked and angry and all the things understandably. And, and I call, I think he called my mom and then I got on the phone with her and told her I needed help. My parents were so shocked, so, so shocked. And then of course they started like piecing back together things like, like remembering things and going, oh, like, was that, you know, trying to like piece this puzzle together. You know, I was, as I said, you know, like throughout school, I, I really kept good grades and everything. And then I was in college and working and had relationships. And it wasn't, I was really, really good at hiding it until I wasn't, you know. And and I went to rehab the first time. And most, you know, there was a hand, at that point, there were a few people that knew because in the 90s in LA, there were, this is like late 90s, there were a lot of people sort of using heroin very casually. Um, and, mm. uh, so there were a few people that knew, but but the vast majority of people in my life and definitely everyone in my family was shocked. And then I spent the next five years just sort of constantly relapsing. And at that point, you know, people were on to me. It was and it got bad. What did that look like constantly relapsing? Uh, it looked like me relapsing, like going for a few months, relapsing, telling everyone I was still sober, still going to 12 step meetings, uh, lying about it. And then I would I would, you know, kick drugs again and just act like I had, it had never happened. So I'd relapse for like a few weeks or a couple months and then be sober again. And then it would happen again. And it was continuous until it got really bad. And I started smoking crack as well. And, you know, got to the point that it was just so bad. I knew that I was going to kill myself or ask for help again. And I asked for help, went to rehab a second time, and I still relapsed after that. How many times did you relapse? I don't even know. I mean, I probably relapsed in my entire life, like more than 50 times. Oh, my gosh. I I wasn't expecting that. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was constant. Those last five five years, I probably relapsed, you know, I don't know, like 10 to 15 times a year because they were short – periods of time that I would relapse and then I would be sober again and relapse and well that leads me to treatment mm-hmm. I mean do you feel like you were getting the right treatment what kinds of places were mm-hmm. you going to um 
Sure. So I went to, both times I went to rehab, they were traditional rehabs based on a 12 step model. Um, you know, the 12 steps helped me a lot in laying a foundation for my for my recovery. But I now don't think that it's the answer for everyone. Mm-hmm. I think that there's not a one size fits all treatment. And just like you would treat any other health issue, if somebody has cancer and there is a chemotherapy protocol and it's not working, you would adjust the protocol to try something else look, and i think it's I the same for this i agree i mean look at look at all the different ways to lose weight yes you know they've got overeaters anonymous mm-hmm. where you go to the 12 steps mm-hmm. and it's like wait what you know and then they've got the weight watchers or the right. nutra systems or the keto or whatever and you're right half the time none of it works for people at all because right. of where their mind's at it's like it's got to be really individualized I, right? I absolutely think so and i also think that we need to destigmatize relapse because it's listen destigmatize that, all of it. all of it absolutely but especially you know with relapse there's like there's there's these expectations there and it's not that you have to relapse but it's i think that if somebody relapses we have to understand that's part of the struggle you know it's not a moral failing to mm-hmm. be struggling with addiction this is this is a human condition that human beings are struggling with and the more we look at it through that lens the easier it is to have compassion for people who are struggling and to treat them not as caricatures that you know we see with the opioid crisis you know there's this sort of like zombified caricatures but these are people that are suffering they sure are um let's talk about the opioid crisis mm-hmm. because you i know you wanted to sit, shed some life on mm-hmm. that and give a voice to it mm-hmm. let's talk about that because nobody knows better than an addict right um do you call yourself an addict or a former addict i mean i you know like i'm not i'm not somebody that's super hung up on labels right. so like i'm fine saying like i was a former heroin addict you know it's been 17 years for me i have been drug free for 17 years so I have enough distance from it that like, I, I don't know, there are people that, that, you know, the terminology has changed. Now we talk about like people with substance use disorders and, and I understand the need for changing terminology. It doesn't bother me for someone to right. call whatever me. Whatever they want to call it, just like yeah. get help, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, but whatever works for people, yes. I get it. But um, let's talk about opioid. Sure. And I agree with you. I will tell you, um, Often if I'm walking down the street, because mm-hmm. it's it's hit all of our communities, mm-hmm. it's hit my community mm-hmm. pretty bad, mm-hmm. and it was never here. And you can see when people are on it, it scares me a little bit, because mm-hmm. I feel like maybe they're going to go out of control. Mm-hmm. And um, what do you do? You're taking the drugs. Mm-hmm. The drugs are accessible. Can't force people into treatment anymore. Mm-hmm. God, where do you start? Well, I mean, I think the first thing to remember is that we need to meet people where they're at. Just because somebody is not ready today doesn't mean that you can't make headway towards offering a path towards treatment. How do we do that? Harm reduction services. We can't keep, we can't help people recover if they're not alive. That's the bottom mm-hmm. line. So what are you saying? Like, so, how do you do sure. harm reduction? So harm, I'm talking about people in the street, for example. Yes. Yeah, so harm reduction services, and this is this is the way that public policy is moving. This is the way that law enforcement has moved in the direction of harm reduction services. This includes needle exchange programs. This includes medicated assisted treatment, which formerly would right. be things like methadone, suboxone, which is an opiate blocker and antagonist. This would be Narcan training, which is the medication that will reverse an overdose. This is fentanyl testing strips because fentanyl is killing people and it's out there in the supply. So in like a harm reduction clinic in major cities, there's harm reduction services like in Los Angeles and in New York, and people can come in and have their drugs tested for fentanyl. There are safe injection sites, which are experimental in this country, but the the rate of relapse of somebody entering treatment through harm reduction services is about half of what it is Mm. for people who just go straight into rehab. And I think that that's important. I think it's really, really important to recognize that because it is not that, you know, we have to look at sort of like the long tail of treating people with addiction. The other really, 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 really important factor is aftercare. We cannot send somebody to rehab for 28 days and then just say, go to some 12-step meetings and you're going to be okay. I recovered because I had access to care. I had the financial and emotional support of a family that was able to provide me with that what access. What did you do? Were, were you at home? I mean, I was, you, so when I, you know, you I was, had a fiance, but you didn't have him. We didn't end up yeah. getting married. So, I get you know, that, I right? Gone, you were probably a little freaked out. But uh, I had gone to rehab a couple of times and, you know, I was still, I had still relapsed. When I um, finally got off of drugs for the final time, I was pregnant. 
and I used drugs in the very beginning of my pregnancy, and I had to find a doctor who was willing to detox me without methadone. Oh. Because at the time, the protocol was that pregnant women were put on methadone, and I really didn't want to go on methadone. So what did you do? So I found a doctor. I, I had a friend that um, helped me, and we made a lot of phone calls, and I found a doctor in L.A., who over the course of seven days using buprenorphine, which is the main ingredient in Suboxone, which is widely prescribed now, um, to help me take, it basically tricks your opiate receptors into believing that it's getting an opiate without really getting an opiate. So the withdrawal symptoms are greatly lessened. And for somebody who's pregnant, a withdrawal can be very harmful to the pregnancy. Nobody thought I should have had that baby. I don't know why I made the decision to have the baby. I didn't know if I wanted to be a mother, but I just made that decision and I knew I committed to being off of drugs during the pregnancy. No one thought that I would stay sober. My parents had made contingency plans for what would happen if I relapsed after I had the baby. And Thank when God I for your parents, yes. Right? And when I had him, you know, I had been very ambivalent during my pregnancy and the first time that I held him, you know, I had, had been off drugs for months, so I had that going for me, but I was not feeling stable. I held that baby in my arms and I looked at him and I just had that like sort of singular thought, I love you more than I hate myself. Wow. And That's beautiful. that was the motivation for me to then do the work I needed to do. Yeah. But I had the support financially and emotionally to do that work. And there are so many moms and parents that don't. And I always want to stress that like just because becoming a mother was sort of the thing that flipped the switch for me that doesn't mean that the parents that are still struggling with addiction don't love their kids they may not have the support systems in place that i did there are you know racial barriers socioeconomic barriers cultural barriers to getting help that are very real for most people it was so hard for me to finally get it and i had all the support in the world I wish that our candidates would be running more on that. You know, mm -hmm. um, it is a crisis beyond. Mm -hmm. And you're right, destigmatizing, yeah, destigmatizing mental health issues. Yes, I mean, sorry, but everybody's got them. Yes, some people take it a lot further, but everybody's got something. I was just ta just talking to a friend of mine as I was getting ready for the show, mm -hmm. who's concerned about his son, mm -hmm. and I can't really get into it much further. And I thought, gosh, everybody's got something. Mm -hmm. Really, everybody's got something. So we were also talking about women, women's right. voices and drug addiction. Right. Talk to me about that. I mean, sure. the percentage of women using drugs is on the rise. Oh, it has it? risen Young girls tremendously. And women. Why? How? Um, you know, I mean, I think certainly, you know, with the with the rise of of during the you know the opioid crisis was certainly contributed. The pharmaceutical companies contributed to it, right? Mm -hmm. At the same time. The reason that people take drugs is because they are treating pain. They're painkillers. They are treating pain. They are treating emotional pain. So even if we punish pharmaceutical companies now and put stricter regulations on opioids, it doesn't solve the problems that are underlying. And as you said, you don't have to have struggled with addiction to understand struggling with shame or or anxiety, depression. We live in a time that is it's very challenging to walk on the planet right now and really not is. have some anxiety or depression about the way things are. And it's not always caused by your parents. No, right? A lot of people no. want to go, well, no. you know, I mean, look, the way we learn how to read and write, it's got to be part of our curriculum in school. A hundred percent. No shame. You know, I've often said our kids should know how to cook and, and sew in mm -hmm. school too. It might mm -hmm. sound ridiculous, but no, it the stuff yeah. you need, you know, mental health mm -hmm. recognizes something's not right. I mean, our social services has to expand in such a big way, but mm -hmm. that's also expensive. Expensive. So, gosh, what's the answer? Well, if we spent, if we spent the money that we have spent incarcerating people for felony drug possession, which heroin is a felony drug possession charge, um, we could yeah. take that money to offer aftercare to people and i think that we would see and i also think for early intervention i think that a lot of our social early. problems early and that means talking to our kids about whatever it is we struggled with when we were kids you know if you i think that we can start having these conversations really early on really early on really early on about you know when i was in first grade i really felt scared or anxious every day i went to school i mean i'm just using an example and i remember feeling that way 
just ha- telling our kids stories about our childhood and whatever it was we experienced leaves the door open for them to come to us if they're struggling with with a feeling. It's the human story, and it yes. doesn't change through generations or centuries mm-hmm. or anything. Right? You know, we're not unique to this. No, of course not. So that's not. why I don't yeah. really quite get the shame, the whole stiff upper lip thing. Right. And I don't think it works. It you doesn't. Know? It doesn't mean you go off crazy, but to be able to discuss it. So I don't know. Maybe that's your job now after it is. writing this it book, strung I mean, out. Right. I mean, to go to what legislators mm-hmm. to go to schools. Get it? Because you, you're right, you got to get people super early, right? Absolutely. And that's part of what I've been able to do now with, you know, starting even before the book came out. And certainly now I have started doing panels and going to conferences where I'm at the table with law enforcement and policymakers. And, you know, my biggest hope for the book is that it opens these conversations up on a public level and also at dinner tables. Mm-hmm. Because it's such a scary topic, but when we have an open and honest conversation about it, It doesn't feel so scary. What do you do if your kid doesn't want to talk about it? I don't think you have to force your kid to talk about it again. I think that sharing, I think that opening up about what we've experienced is a, is a pathway to them opening up. Mm -hmm. I really do. Because again, I know some kids, they might feel so much shame. They'll Mm -hmm. look at you and go, well, okay, cool. But that was you. Like, I'm like, fine. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? And they're not fine. Right. And sometimes I think parents don't know what to do. Right. So I think, you know, I mean, if you're talking about somebody where they think their child is already struggling with addiction, um, you know, I certainly think that that mental health intervention is is essential because I again, I think that like, you know, kids certainly experiment with drugs, but there's a difference. There's a marked difference from what I've seen from experiment, normal experimentation and a kid that is looking to escape reality. Yeah. And the kid that's looking to escape reality really needs the support of of therapy. I'm a big believer in talk therapy, having another adult that's not their parent to talk to and confide in. You know, and it's again, it's a it's a long term thing. It's not something as parents, you know, I'm a parent now. I have two kids. and How old are they now? I have a 16-year-old and a 2-year-old. And that 16-year-old was the one that we were talking about yes. earlier. And how's he doing? He's great. He's you great. Know? I so mean, no effects. No, I mean, no. I mean, you know, he has his own stuff that he deals with. Thankfully, he has not had any issues with any addiction. And, and you know, the prologue to this book, I start with the question my son asked me when he was 12. He asked me, we were watching a news program where they were talking about a drug overdose. And he asked me, Mom, did you ever do drugs? And I didn't know how to answer him. And it took me, you know, some thinking and time. And before his 13th birthday, I I had I sat him down and told him that I needed to talk to him about something. And I shared what my experience had been without going into great detail. And we can do this in an age appropriate way. Mm. But I think that it's important for kids to understand that we know what it's like, whatever our experience has been with alcohol, drugs, depression, whatever. I think it's important to share whatever our experience has been Mm. because it lets them know that that we aren't so out of touch with those feelings. Mm -hmm. And when I had the conversation with him, which was really scary for me, the most amazing thing is the first thing he did was he hugged me and he said, Mom, I'm so sorry you had to go through that. What a beautiful story. And it, See what brings you to tears? Yeah. Your son is still bringing yeah, you to tears. <laughs> but how beautiful is that? Yeah. How are mom and dad now? Because I can't imagine how strung out. What a great name for this. Everybody's strung out. Yeah. You're strung out. Your parents are strung <laughs> out. Um, how are they now? Oh, they're fantastic. I have such a good relationship with both of my parents yeah, now. But I, I can't mean, imagine you look, you're a parent. You want to oh, help and you don't know what course. to do. And your daughter is relapsing 50 plus times. Yeah. And it's like, oh, my God, I don't want to find her dead. Right. You oh, know? no, I think that there were years that my parents, those those years from the time they found out to when I finally got it, those five years, they were my mother said she didn't sleep. She always thought she was going to get a phone call. And, you know. It's, it's funny because like in talking about it, because obviously, you know, like people are like, oh, do you blame your parents if things had been different, if they hadn't gotten divorced? And I don't in any way blame my parents for my addiction, first of all. And, and you know, the thing, you know, as you know, like once you become a parent, yeah, of course, there are things that if they could go back and do differently, they have said, you know, oh, they probably would. But I don't know that it would. Would it have made any difference? I don't yeah, know. I don't know. And I don't they, know. you know, when you become a parent, you don't stop be, being an imperfect human being mm-hmm. and 
And I think becoming a parent really, really brought this sort of like full circle healing to my relationship with my mom. They've both read the book. They're really, really Ugh. proud of me. That's not an Great easy book. book for your parents to read. No, or your son. No. And they're, you know, the fact that like they are so supportive and like tell all their friends about it and everything is amazing. I yeah, feel it's beautiful. really, really lucky. Yeah, we got to get the word out. It's yes. important. Um, there's so much to talk about. I mean... You know, but I guess we have to end here. But, you know, everything. For, also, accessibility to the drugs. It's everywhere. Mm, everywhere. Um, it's put people out on the streets. Mm -hmm. Women are taking it more. Abuse, sexual abuse. That's something that we need to dive into mm -hmm. a little more. Because I think there's a lot of people who have been abused. Mm -hmm. And whatever it does to trigger their minds, they take it out. And they take these drugs. They mm -hmm. want to, you know, calm their mind. Right. Um, is there anything you could say to somebody who might be watching or listening mm -hmm. to this who is prone to want to take the drugs. Is there anything you could say to hold, feel like you could hold it back or no? I mean, the thing that I'll say is that I always felt when I was younger that the things that I was trying to push down, the things that I was afraid of people knowing, even telling, you know, somebody that I was strung out, mm. the, all those things that I was afraid of people knowing, I thought if they knew this about me, like no one would love me. You know, that's, I mean, not that I had that complete thought, but that's the primal fear. If you knew X about me, you wouldn't love me. And if I could go back and talk to myself then or talk to anybody else that's, who's struggling, I would say it's okay to show people who you are. Yeah. And, you know, like I say this to anyone who's struggling, like I see you, I love you, and you are worth it. You are worthy of love. You are worthy of kindness. You are worthy of food and shelter. You're still a human being. Yeah. You haven't lost your humanity. Yeah. And if you can, you know, I'm not necessarily a religious person because I'm not. But if you think about it, people have just gotten so far away mm -hmm. from kind of believing in a higher purpose mm -hmm. or being. And maybe if we had that a little more in our lives, you know, just believe that we're OK just as we are. And some something, some forces looking Connection. out for you. That's Connection. what religion gave people, right? Yeah. Connection. And many of we us lost our way. I think that's there's a famous uh, TED talk by Johan Hari called the everything you knew about addiction we thought we knew about addiction was wrong and he says the opposite of addiction is connection, connection. and I think people that's are lonely they're scared true. right yes. I agree and we have to work on that too there's so much but it's all in your book please everybody pick it up strung out one last hit and other lies that nearly killed me Aaron Carr anything you want to say to our people how they can get the book how they can get in touch with you and sure. find you sure so the book is available everywhere the books are sold Target Amazon your independent bookstores um, you can find it everywhere if you want to get in touch with me you can go to AaronCarr.com there's a contact form you can reach out to say hi uh, do you talk ask to me people and ask Aaron question <laughs> yeah they ask Aaron right on yes, your so what I, do you I, talk about on the column well it, you know I get all sorts of questions it's funny I get a lot of the same question over and over and over again in different forms like, which is a lot about like a relationship where a partner has pulled away mm. get a lot of relation uh, relationship questions that have to do with one partner wanting to open up to like a polyamorous situation which I was like I had no idea so many people were wanting to try open relationships and me um, neither. <laughs> and unfortunately, <laughs> since like the Me Too movement, I have had a flood of questions from young women wanting to know if what happened to them was rape. And that has wow. been heartbreaking, heartbreaking. And I've actually had a lot of questions from men wanting to know if what they did was a form of date rape or what they did was pushing someone into sex and wanting to talk about consent in a new and different way. And I have to say, I really, really appreciate that there are people on both sides of it that are willing to kind of say like, okay, how can we talk about consent moving forward? So there's all sorts of those topics that, that wow. come up on Ask Aaron and, and I have it, you know, I've got 500,000 readers, a readership of 500,000 people. And I started it on my blog and it's just sort of it's exploded. many years ago, it grew and grew and grew over like 11 years. I learned a lot by reading through it. And I think people learn a lot by reading through mm -hmm. a blog or advice mm -hmm. columns. I really do because yeah. you're not alone. Right. That's like we were talking about before. Yeah. You're not alone. So also look up Ask Aaron. Um, it's worth your time. It's really great. And please pick up the book, Strung Out. Are you appearing anywhere on any... Uh, 
Uh, any book tours? I any... am. I'm on book tour right now. My next uh, stop will be Miami. Oh. Next week I'll be at Books and Books in Coral Gables. Mm. And then I'll be in Hudson, New York on the 14th of March at great... Spotty Dog Books. Spotty Dog Books. That's yeah. a great book tour. Wow. Yeah. Now you're out here in L.A. So yeah, thank you for coming. Yeah, I've been all and... over. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you for visiting us. Thank Aaron you. Carr, Strung Out, and uh, please pick it up. And I really appreciate everybody uh, for joining us in this really important conversation today uh, for Deborah Cobelt Live. And you can find our podcast. We put it out on Facebook and YouTube. And then the audio version is everywhere. Spotify, Spreaker, Apple Podcasts, uh, iHeartRadio, um, Google. So just find us. We'll be there. Uh, Deborah Cobelt Live. And we will see you next time. Bye.